reading from the book of Daniel. In the first year of King Balthasar of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head as he lay in bed. Then he wrote down the dream. I, Daniel, saw in my vision by night the four winds of heaven stirring up the great sea, and four great beasts came up out of the sea, different from one another. As for me, Daniel, my spirit was troubled within me, and the visions of my head terrified me. I approached one of the attendants to ask him the truth concerning all this. So he said that he would disclose to me the interpretation of the matter. As for these four great beasts, four kings shall arise out of the earth, but the holy ones of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever forever and ever. The word of the Lord. I see to God. We will read Psalm 149 responsibly by whole verse. Hallelujah, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing his praise in the congregation of the faithful. Let Israel rejoice in his nature. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their name. Let them praise his name in the dance. Let 
Let them sing praise to him with timbrel and harp. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people and adorns the poor with victory. Let the faithful rejoice in triumph. Let them be joyful on their beds. Let the praises of God be in their throat and the two-edged sword in their hand. To wreak vengeance on the nations and punishment on the peoples. To bind their kings and chains and their nobles with wings of fire. To inflict on them the judgment decree. This is glory for all his faithful people. Hallelujah. A reading from the letter, from the letter of Paul to the Ephesians. In Christ we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we, who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption of God's own people, to the praise of his glory. <clears throat> I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. And for this reason, I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the Lord, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe, according to the worker, the working of his great power. God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead, and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Oh, mm -hmm. 
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven. For that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. But I say to you that listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, Pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Let us pray. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. 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 When I saw that I was preaching on this gospel passage, I tried to rewrite it from memory. This is a trick that one of my first preaching professors taught me. And it's because what you have committed to memory and what is forgotten can tell you a lot about your relationship to the text and how the text was given to you. So when I went to write this, I got most of it down, but I forgot something pretty massive. I forgot all of the woes in Luke's gospel. I'm used to hearing Matthew's version in the Beatitudes. What Luke says with a more material focus, Matthew emphasizes more spiritually. While Luke says, blessed are the poor, Matthew says, blessed are the poor in spirit. And blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And there are no woes in Matthew. I wonder if I heard Matthew so much more because it's a little easier to digest from a middle-class background that I came from in my church. The church can find it easy to focus on spiritual blessing, but it gets a bit more tangled up when it comes to material blessings. I think it's fair to say that it's easier to hear that God blesses the poor in spirit than the poor. If God blesses the poor, actually, I have a lot of questions for God about what blessing is. Is it the idea that the poor may suffer now, but God will bless them later, what some have called the pie in the sky after we die theology? Is it this idea that there are spiritual blessings in the simplicity of a poor life? Well, I would contend that living in financial hardship is anything but simple. And I think anyone in this room who has had financial struggles 
of any kind can attest to that. So what does Jesus mean that the poor in spirit and the poor in this material life are blessed? People often pit the material against the spiritual, don't they? But I am not so sure that's what Jesus intended. And since it's the celebration of All Saints Day, I wanted to turn to the life and work of Dorothy Day, one of my favorite saints, to help us deal with this false division of the spiritual and material and examine what Jesus might have meant here by blessed with the inheritance of the kingdom of God. Dorothy Day, famous for her founding of the Catholic worker communities, journal, newspaper, and her personal writings on voluntary poverty, had a lot to say about the false division of the spiritual and material in church work. The foundation of her work were the acts of mercy from the Catholic Church. There are the spiritual works of mercy, instructing the ignorant, counseling the doubtful, rebuking the sinner, bearing wrongs patiently, forgiving all injuries, and praying for the living and the dead. And, she said, there are the material works of mercy, feeding the hungry, giving drink to the thirsty, clothing the naked, sheltering the homeless, visiting the sick, ransoming the prisoner, and burying the dead. Which list do you think gets more attention from the church? It's a good practice to see what you remember as mercy and what you forget. Dorothy Day thought the latter works were forgotten more than remembered. Thus, she set out her life to live not in charity to the poor, but in solidarity with them, following the example of many saints before her, one in particular, St. Francis. She took trouble with charity work as the primary way for the church to fulfill the material works of mercy. In our country, she says, our response to poverty and hunger has been characteristically American. We have tried to clean up everything by building bigger and better shelters and hospitals. We've tried to care for misery in efficient and orderly ways through institutions. But charity, she says, is only as warm as those who administer it. In her vision of care for the poor, you should hand out food to the hungry, yes, no questions asked, but you should also share the meal served in community and expect Christ to be present in surprising ways even. For her, going beyond charity demanded the radical commitment of communal living and shared property. Her Catholic worker houses were places where people did this every single day, <coughs> sharing food, shelter, bills, and church. It wasn't a to-do list of works, but rather, rather a way of everyday living. And this type of living deeply inspires and enlivens me. But beginnings are always exciting, she writes in one of her first books. As she continued to live this way, she wasn't illusory about the stakes of this radical life. She describes her community as not a community of saints, but rather a slipshod group of individuals who are trying to work out certain principles. And chief among these, were an analysis of man's freedom and what it implied. It was a practice in paying the cost of love. Throughout this practice, she often asked, where does the folly of the cross end and begin? And this is a question I wonder often when I think about my faith and what it asks of me. And I wonder if I really do believe the words of Jesus in Matthew 25, that whatever I do to the least of these, I do to him as well. And that if I want to know Jesus, I must know the least of these. A friend of mine shared something recently <coughs> about an encounter he had where someone tried to steal his bike. He's more committed to living in solidarity than most people I know. He was sitting on a bridge 
after a long bike ride, and a man came up to him and said, Is this your bike? Yes, my friend said. Well, it's mine now, the man said, and started to walk away with it. No, my friend said. I need this. I don't have a car. And he grabbed it back and quickly rode away. Later, he started reflecting on the experience. I could have easily bought another $100 bike, he reflected. And I'm almost certain that that man could not. People assured him, my friends assured him, he was justified by riding away with what was his. He really did need it. He didn't have a car, he had to get to work. But my friend wasn't sure that that was the right question. Would Jesus have let him have the bike, he asked. I didn't know. I guessed he might have. What if that man was Jesus? He was serious when he asked this. He concluded that he didn't know. But he did know that Jesus said you should give people your possessions when they ask for them. And the way to gain eternal life was to sell everything you own and give the money to the poor. And he didn't do that. And neither does anyone else he knows. Who is going to show us how to live, he asked. I share many of the same questions. And even Dorothy Day, who did live a radically open life, sharing her possessions, her home, and time with the community, committed to the words of Christ, admits that the ideas of poverty and shared living are a glowing thing in Franciscan literature. But once she started living them out, she realized how many illusions we tend to have about it. This turning the other cheek, she says, this inviting someone else to be a potential thief or murderer in order that we might grow in grace, how obnoxious. In that case, I believe I'd rather be the striker than the meek one struck. One would almost rather be a sinner than a saint at the expense of a sinner. But no, she concludes, somehow we must be saved together. So what does Jesus mean when he says, blessed are the poor? Because theirs is the kingdom of God. You know, I think I will be figuring that out for the rest of my life. Native American theologian George Tink Tinker suggests that maybe a better question we can ask is not what is the kingdom of God, but where is the kingdom of God? The witness of St. George makes me think I should look wherever there is a shared meal with the hungry, clothing of the naked, shelter and care for the homeless, and freedom for the incarcerated. When we are where these things are happening, which I know many of you are, and I love learning from your witness as well, we are close to the kingdom. And not only are we close to the kingdom, but we are close to Christ. We are close to knowing Christ, learning from Christ, and shaping this kingdom together. If I get caught up pondering the theology of blessing, but have separated the question from being amidst God's work, I will never know. And this is something I tend to forget when studying and writing, that I must live this question. In the words of St. Francis, I cannot know what I do not practice. Maybe said another way, I cannot be where I am not. And maybe if we go there together, to the places where Jesus says we will meet him, we can figure out what it means to be blessed with the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. Amen.
In peace and in faith, let us offer our prayers. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. That we all may be one. Grant that every member of the Church may truly and humbly serve you. That every name may be glorified by all people. We pray for Michael, our presiding bishop, William, our bishop, for Megan and Ali, our priests, and Vasu, our deacon. That they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. We pray for Joseph, our president, Philip, our governor, and all who govern and hold authority in this nation and in the world. That there may be justice and peace on earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. That our works may find favor in your sight. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble, and strengthen those who care for them, especially those who have asked our prayers, including Joyce, Patsy, Carol, Janine, Patricia, Vibart, Barbara, Bruce, Carol, Barbara, Herb, Mildred, Valerie, Robert, Tom, Hibbert, Sean, Taylor, Ralph, Yvonne, Pat, Bobby, Jacob, Susan, Betty, Bella, for Herman and Claudia's family. We pray also for Pastor Alley and the staff and patients at Trenton Psychiatric Hospital, and for John and the staff and patients at Ann Klein Forensic Center. that they may be delivered from their distress. We pray for those whose lives are linked with ours, especially those celebrating birthdays this week, including Alan Schoes, Kellen Fisher, Cece Herman, and those celebrating anniversaries and other occasions for joy. Let us rejoice in the Lord always. We remember before you, Lord, this day, those whom we love but see no longer, especially Sarah Aoro, Patricia Barker, Ed and Vivian Blackwell, Jack Burns, Barry Coleman, Jean and Robert Coleman, Susan Davis, Robert and Cecil Duran, Thomas and Bobby Galloway, Arnold Giovanetti, George and Betsy Gray, Margaret Hickman, Phyllis Jenkins, Shirley Lentz, Max, Kitty Hewitt Moore, Ruth Ellen Moreno, Gloria Nevius, Sonia Olson, Ruth Patterson, Don Patterson, Cynthia Piegler, Millie Quinones, Donna Ransahoy, Jack Rice, Brett Rigby, Wendell Sancho, Yvette Santiago Green, Leslie Shear, Betty Smith, John Seuss, Albert Sternberg, James and Dorothy Townsend, Susan Travers, Everett Van Kuyken, Chip Walker and Bob Crosby, Claudia Wallace, Mary Lou Wayne, Barbara Williams, Cindy Williams, Gilbert Williams, Frederick Wingate, Joseph Zesky Sr. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let us have a perpetual shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. Let us pray for our own needs and the needs of others. Almighty God, by your Holy Spirit you have made us one with your saints in heaven and on earth. Grant that in our earthly pilgrimage we may always be supported by this fellowship of love and prayer, and know ourselves to be surrounded by their witness to your power and mercy. We ask this for the sake of Jesus Christ, in whom all our intercessions are acceptable through the Spirit and who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most 
away yesterday morning. Most of us did not know, uh, a few of us did, that Claudia had been quite ill for several months. And when I spoke to her a couple times uh, in the last couple of weeks, she was optimistic that um, I, I guess some kind of chemotherapy and uh, associated drug regimen was going to help her and, and she was looking forward to that. And I've even heard that last Sunday afternoon from the hospital emergency room, she was part of a meeting, our, our what we call the PCOM committee. It's the parish committee on ministry, which is right now supporting Brooke in her ordination process. And they were having one of their regular meetings with Brooke and she was part of it from the hospital you know we often talk about supporting congregations and we often put it in terms of finances I will tell you what supports the life of a congregation and the mission and the ministry that God gives to each congregation, each fellowship that is part of the body of Christ is the time and the diligence and the commitment of the saints. That's us. We are the saints, saints on earth. We think of the saints who have gone before and pray to be part of that fellowship someday too. Some point in the next few days, I'm sure I will hear from Claudia's family about funeral arrangements. I will let you know. It's entirely possible the funeral will be held at Grace St. Paul, which is a larger sanctuary. Claudia had many friends. I can't imagine that we could get all of Claudia's friends into this intimate space. But we will let you know. In the meantime, please just take a look at your bulletin. There's lots going on around Thanksgiving, support for the cathedral's food pantry, Thanksgiving distribution, uh, cards for Cristo Rey Iglesia family. Um, there's just lots, always lots going on. Next week, we will hear from one of the uh, AA group, member from one of our AA groups that meets here. We have three now. Uh, and I hope you will come and, and hear that. And then on the last Sunday of our pledge season, the 20th, we hope to hear from our intrepid saints, Joan Brain and Felicia Alexander, about their time serving in Peru with global volunteers. So be here. Ascribe to the Lord the honor to his name, bring offerings, and come into his courts.
body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Mm -hmm. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. The body of Christ. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. The body of Christ. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. 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 Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us to spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart, through Christ our Lord. Amen. May the blessing of God, our Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer, be with you this day and always. Amen. Let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Spirit 
Alleluia, alleluia.